Well, good morning. I'm glad you braved the cold. And those people that are going to stay up late tonight, braved the early morning too. So, All right, so um, Kyle asked me to um, share a couple of things that were on my heart or something that was on my heart. So one of the biggest things that happened this year to me was that I turned 50. Um, and so I thought that, um, I know I don't look it, I get it, I, I get it. Um, I thought I'd share a couple of things and, um, about lessons that I've learned at 50, maybe lessons that I wish I'd learned a little bit earlier. Um, and now I'm going to share three things. There's probably a whole bunch of things that I could share and that list could be much longer. I mean, especially don't have, when you're 50, don't have an eight year old, a 10 year old and a 13 year old in the house. Kids early, get them out of the house. Okay. That's one lesson I've learned. All right. The other thing I've learned is buy a house that has more grass. I mean, more concrete than grass. Okay. The, all that mowing and people will really take care of their lawns here. We, in England, we got like lawns that are tiny and they're easy. You can just put a hover mower or you can get one of those robo mowers and you're done in a few minutes. Okay. But there's a whole bunch of things that I could put on the list, but I'm just going to share three that really, I, I believe that have impacted me greatly um, at, at this particular age. And so the first thing is going to be life isn't like the movies. Now, it depends on what movies you're watching, of course. Now, if you're watching Disney movies, as my 13-year-old um, frequently points out, do you know the parents always die at the beginning of Disney movies? Have you noticed that? Bambi? Mumfasa? Dies right at the beginning of the movie, right? Tarzan, how do you think Tarzan was raised by apes? Okay, his parents died at the beginning of the movie. And it goes on, you know, the prequel to Little Mermaid, his mom, her, her mom dies on the rocks uh, at sea. And I'm like, sorry kids, but you, these are movies that your parents are making you watch, okay? Um, but life isn't like the movies, okay? We know that. And the, even with the Disney movies, we know that everything is going to be, be happily ever, ever after. But I hate to break it to you, life rarely goes according to plan. There's no such thing as karma. You know that? There's no such thing as karma. Even we, we bandy the word around, there's no such thing as karma. Yes, there are consequences. But I know people personally in my life um, that have passed away that never ever dealt with the consequences of things that they've done. So we know there's no karma. Revenge, I hate to break it to you, revenge doesn't provide closure. You think how many revenge movies that I watch. Okay, we watch it because we're not in real life. It doesn't happen that way. Revenge doesn't provide you with closure. And God reminds us, revenge is mine, not yours. That's my job. People don't change overnight. You see how many movies you watch and then suddenly, you know, by the end of the movie, within a few minutes they've changed. Oh, and I'm like, what? Okay, that's good for a movie. But the reality is we don't change overnight. There are miraculous events. There are times when God intervenes, but there, we don't change overnight. For you guys that are not married, you're probably not going to marry your best friend. Okay? How many movies do you watch where they, you marry your best friend? Now, it does happen. Don't get me wrong. It does happen. And then all the love stories. And I try to avoid these movies as much as possible. But my wife makes me watch them. And I have to sit there. But we know that love stories don't always have a happy ending. In fact, in my experience, and maybe yours, um, that true love really only happens with good hard work and is only successful with good hard work. Any relationship you have, and I've got a very strong relationship with my wife, and I thank God for that every day, um, but it only happens with hard work. You have to work for each other. It doesn't happen like the movies. It doesn't, you know, the happily ever after. That's just the beginning of what will be a long process. So life isn't like the movies. And you know, in reality, bad things happen to good people. I sort of show you a picture. I, um, a number of years ago, when I actually first came here, I, after the tsunami, it happened around about Christmas time, the tsunami that came through um, in Thailand. I visited Thailand um, about a year and a half or somewhere around there. Um, later. And I was working at the time with Lutheran Am Ministries. I was um, sending volunteers all over the world and, and, and setting uh, projects up, mission projects up. And one of the projects we did was to build boats for families 
in the aftermath of the um, tsunami. And this is one of the families that I met. I went to their house. The, an organization had built some houses for them, and we had built fishing boats because that was their livelihood. The difference being is all, there were three ladies living in the house, and all of their, hus her, their husbands had died in the tsunami. So they were left with their kids. Their husbands, who were, were the fisher um, people that brought the income, the fisher people that brought the income. And so what they did is get together, banded together. We built them two boats, and they were able to keep their, their income. And you can see that the picture on the, to your right um, is the one of the, the size of the wave. It's a monument that was built. It's the size of the wave, and you can see the people standing next to it, the size of the wave that they would have experienced as it was coming in the tsunami. And I met many families. I traveled um, and, and met with many families that were devastated by that. Um, and, you know, they were so, it always sticks in my mind that they were so thankful. Here was this Western guy that turned up and, you know, was like, really had done very little to, to earn their um, thanks. And yet, they had all lost their husbands. They were moving on. And I'm like, why do bad things happen to good people? And Plato once said that the only dead, only the dead have seen the end of war. Unfortunately, a lot, not a lot has changed, has it? We know that that still goes on and it goes on. And Jesus says in John 16 and 33, he says, In this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. And Paul also reminds Timothy, us in Timothy 3.12, he says, Anyone who wants to live all out for Christ is in for a lot of trouble and there's no getting around it. You know, as a Christian, I believe the world, both humanity and nature, is impacted by sin. That's the reality. We see it in evil. We see it in decay. We see it in things that go wrong for people. And bad things happen to good people. You're like, oh, man. Thank goodness it's been New Year's Eve tonight. I can go party and get myself out of the bad mood that Andrew put me in this morning. What makes my view, my understanding, what makes my view any different to an atheist? or a humanist, wherever that might be. What makes this seemingly such a pessimistic view so different? Well, here's the narrative that I've, become, uh, I've learned over my course of 50-something years. 50 years. Let's keep it there. It's 50 years. Well, here's the narrative I believe in. That first of all, God does, and can and does, miraculously intervene. I can speak to that from a personal point of view. And more, but more importantly, I want to say that he has given humanity the ability through Jesus to actually push back against the sin, the impact of sin in this world. You know, I think about the verse that when Jesus prays, he says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I wonder if he pictured all of us when he said that. Because what he had said was, through you, through the people that have submitted to Jesus, that have experienced Jesus, that's how the kingdom was going to come. See, my hope, the narrative that I've begun to see is that I see the gospel, thy kingdom come, come in people like you and me every single day. What we're doing through Empower North County, what you're doing with your neighbor, what you do at your job, it's thy kingdom come. And that's the difference in the narrative of the movies, the narrative of the atheist, the narrative that I have is that I, I believe through Jesus we can push back against the impact of sin. Yeah, it's a perpetual battle, and it will continue until Jesus comes again. But I believe we can change this community. I've seen the impact already of what Empower North County does, the impact that I see on kids. I mean, I, you know, who would have thought that we had 120 kids um, on a regular basis playing soccer? There's actually some families missing this morning because they're playing soccer. I mean, there's some families that I saw at Christmas service that I've never seen before here that are part of that soccer, uh, part of a soccer team. I've seen families that are impacted every day because of Jesus through me and you that are pushing back. I mean, I wasn't here, I was at the soccer thing, but there were so many testimonies of the day when we did the affordable Christmas store here. Thy kingdom come. See, that's the narrative that's different to the movies. No, we didn't all go away and have happy endings. There were families that were still struggling. But we saw the power of lives lived through Jesus pushing back against that sin and decay. So first lesson, life isn't like the movies. Learn the narrative of what the gospel can do. Second thing is embrace mystery. 
and, and, and these are very personal things, and it's just a one-off series. We're not, I mean, you know, we're not going to be talking about this next week. There's a new series beginning next week. But these are very personal things for me. Embrace mystery. You know, as a Christian, I've had to come to terms with there's a lot of things, and I'm talking about my faith primarily um, because I understand everything else. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things that I don't understand. It really is. You know, I, I, I grew up a very strict Christian. I think some of you have heard my story. Grew up a very strict Christian. We went to church three times during the week. You complain about Sunday morning. We went to church three times a week in the evening. And then on Sunday, we got together at 10 o'clock and we spent the entire day together. And we had children's church in between the morning church and evening church. And you had to sit there for like long, long sermons. And it wasn't entertaining, believe me. And there probably is very few people that know the Bible like I do. I spent 12 years at an organization called Luther Now Ministries. A lot of the content, the apologetics content, which is defense of your faith content about Christianity, is written by me. I've written a lot of that stuff. And so I have, I have, I've done, spent all these, time, these years and I've had experiences with church that have made me question why. I'm an INTJ, and if you know an INTJ, you're very strategic, forward thinking, you're trying to work things, solve problems, and I've never been able to crack that nut. And you know, for, for, uh, I can tell you personally from experience that that can break you. Trying to work, why do these things happen? What's happening here? Why God? Now, I'm not talking about, there's some things that you'll never understand too, that, um, you know, things like, what does Kyle put on his driver's license for the color of his hair? <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? I mean, you know, that's okay, I can live with that. I'm a, at a movie theater. Which armrest is yours? <laughs> and when you're with your kids, yeah, no, that's mine. Yeah. Or why, if you're skating on thin ice, can you end up in hot water? <laughs> These are the mysteries, right? But the ones I've really struggled with is what about things like the virgin birth? What about communion? What is the Trinity? Why does this happen? Why does that happen? And I've really, I've spent a lot of my life struggling with those things. And Paul echoes this, and I, I love this verse, and I've really begun to understand this as I've got older and be comfortable with it. It says in, echo, it, it, in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, verse 12, and I think we have verse 12 on the screen. It said, he says, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part... And we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall fo know fully, even as I have been fully known. And I love the older versions, the King James Version that we um, grew up in um, was... I see through it, we see through a glass darkly. It's just such a conjures up such a, an, uh, an image. And there's lots of other verses where Paul talks about the mystery, the mysteries, the things that we won't understand. Even David looks at those things. There's things that we we'll understand. And I could never settle with that. Always struggled and fought against it. But I've learned to be okay with the mysteries. And in many cases, I just embrace them and be in awe of what those mysteries are. You see, because I built a foundation, my foundation is now built on what I know and have complete faith in, not in what I don't know. And you know what I know? That being a disciple of Jesus has never let me down. That's what I know. There's times when I look at something and I say, I don't know why. I don't know why. But then I always come back to my faith foundation of saying, I've never gone wrong by being a disciple of Jesus. Jesus says, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. It's quite simple, really. Yeah, it's tough. And there's some dark times with that. And this is why doubt doesn't trouble me anymore. You know, I went through many years of doubt. And, and you experience the church upbringing that I experienced. You do have legitimate doubts. There are people that have taught you year after year after year and many years of your life. You, don't, you watch those co um, programs about cults and indoctrination, you're like, how can they do that? Well, if you spend day in, day out, you're never exposed to anything outside of it, it happens. And, you, and then suddenly it all gets undermined because you understand that it was all wrong. 
It messes with me. But I've learned that I, I don't fear doubt anymore because I've built my foundation on Jesus. And really, it has proven to be unshakable. I I've, I've, haven't built my foundation on Bible school. I've spent time at Bible school. I haven't built my um, foundation on the Nazarene church. Sorry, uh, Mike. Yeah. I haven't built my foundation on the Nazarene church, the Baptist church, the Catholic church. I built my foundation on Jesus. Sure, I keep learning more, I keep learning more things, but since my foundation is strong, it just adds to the building. It doesn't chip away at my foundation. So embrace mystery. Spend time living on what you know, not on what you don't know. Three, I'll spend a little more time on this, um, is stop chasing the wind. You know, a few years ago, and, and a lot of you know this personal story of mine, a few years ago, um, I was in hospital, and I was at work and basically started feeling pains in my chest, and um, I walked down, I got my, I had a meeting and I was like, went over to the person and said, hey, you know, I can't, I can't make a meeting, I'm, I'll catch up with you later, I'll reschedule it. And I put on my coat and I go downstairs and I was going to drive myself to hospital. I got out to my car and I'm like, oh, I don't really feel great here. So I went back into the receptionist and said, hey, call an ambulance. And the ambulance comes and they're like, oh, you know, okay. And I, I get on, I've got my coat on and I get on the ambulance and I'm like, who are you? And I'm like, you came for me. So I take my coat off and I'm folding it neatly and they're like, oh, another overweight middle-aged male that's under too much stress. Um, you know, and then they put these things on my heart and they're like, oh, which hospital do you want to go to? And I said, probably the closest. Um, and we ended up going to, um, I think it was, yeah, Mercy, um, right there where I work. Um, and I remember laying on the, the bed and, you know, we were there doing things like, you need to call your wife. I'm like, oh, don't worry. Her. And like, no, you need to call your wife. And they're like talking to me and I'm like, oh, you support a, you're English, you support a soccer team? And, and I'm like, sure, yeah. And they're like, what? And one of the nurses, the nurses said, hey, you know, I like Arsenal. I said, do you really want my blood pressure to go up in this room? <laughs> and at that time, they're looking for paddles. I know they're like, where's the paddles? You know, what I'm talking about, those things you see in the movies, they're looking for it. And it suddenly just hit me that I was in a situation where I might die. And in that moment, my thinking was, what do I have? What will I leave? And what's important? Now, I didn't have it written down or anything like that, but that's what I was mulling over in my mind. What will I leave? What do I have? What do I leave? What will I leave? And what's important? You know, life is very circular. There's a lot of things that we're going to do that are repetitious. You know, getting up in the morning, showering, brushing your teeth, doing all the rhythm of the day, and life become, can become such a circle that we just get stuck in a rut, that we just keep going. And then we look at what society tells us that we must live like, and we get in, stuck in that cycle too. We need more education. We need, we need more money. We need a, a, a better house. We need that new position. We need better weather. That's my dad. My dad is like perpetually lives under the fact that in England it rains all the time and I hate it. Which, you know, most of the time it isn't raining, but, you know, that's my dad's perception. He's in that rut. If I had that relationship, if I had that spouse, you know, hmm, once I get this, once I get that, we're always pushing for something. And the reality is the same thing that comes with fame is the same things that come with those things that you're looking for. We're so addicted to the chase. And it ends up being nothing but wind. And I'm going to read um, First Ecclesiastes. And I, I, this is a fairly long verse, and I apologize. And I read it as quick as I can. But there's just there's such a, an impact on this for me. And it, it says, what is it? and another thing you learn at 50 as you're reading, it gets much more, more difficult. But, um, <laughs> and things start getting further and further away. What does a man gain from his labor? at which he toils under the sun. Generations come, generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning to its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. Another mystery. To the place where streams come from. They will, there they return. I guess that's a mystery that 
Solomon would have not thought about, but now um, it's amazing that we've seen that, and it still points to God. Um, All things are wearisome. More than, than one can, more than one can say, the eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been done will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything, anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. There is no remembrance of men of old. And even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. Think about that. Do you know your great, 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 great grandparent? Their name? The teacher. I was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study, to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. I think what I've begun to learn as I get older, and I wish I'd learned this a lot earlier, that yes, you really do need to have goals. Yes, it's perfectly okay to have dreams and aim at something. It's perfectly okay to have a nicer car. But take a really good look at your motivation of why you're chasing that. You see, because Solomon, who was one of the wise guys of the the Bible, one of the wisest people that um, has ever walked the face of the earth began to understand that all this repetitious, all this chasing, trying to get better, trying to get something more, trying to be in a better place, he realized that in the end, you have to come back to a central motivation of who God is in your life. I think that um, sometimes, I mean, and you could really go from my first point, you could say, life isn't like the movies and life isn't like social media. Okay? We're always thinking, I always worry about when people come over to us, oh, it isn't quite as tidy as I want. Well, sometimes you just have to break that cycle and just focus on the things that are important in your life. This is one of my friends. Uh, um, I share a couple of pictures from my friend's Facebook page. She's like, I really enjoyed seeing all your pictures of your kids in front of the Christmas tree and how nice your de- de- decor is in your house and everything, but here's how my house looks right now. That's a very brave thing. Now, a little later on, she did post some pictures of it all cleaned up, thankfully. But who posts this stuff on social media? No one ever posts those things on social media, right? We're chasing it. We're always putting on what we're getting, the new good things, the new job. It's okay. They're fine. They can, they can talk. It's un- I get it. I've got three of them. We're, you know, you, you look at those things and you say, oh, you know, if I had a nice, tidy house like those people, if I had a, a nice, tidy car, like that person, if I had this set up in my life. And it's constantly, because we have the wrong motivation, what will happen is we'll reach out and we'll be on our our bed thinking about life and all of it will be dust. My career at Lutheran Hour Ministry is as high as it went. When I had my heart attack, that wasn't one of the things that I was holding on to. You know, my wife and I talked about this. It's been probably the, the struggle of our lives and of our marriage in terms of trying to do things within Power North County, trying to live on a lot less money than we were used to. Um, and I was talking to my parents on Christmas Day, and they're like, well, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to get a job? Which, yes, I'm going to get a job. But I've turned a job down that's much better paying so I could focus on the things that we believe we want to do. And I said, in all honesty, this has been the biggest struggle of our marriage. It's been the biggest, biggest struggle, but both of us would go through the same thing again because it's also been some of the best times of our life. Because we're doing, we're not chasing the wind anymore. Yeah. We're chasing what God has for us. Sorry, you can yeah. sit further back next time. <laughs> we're chasing what God has for us, and it has so much more meaning. So it's okay to chase your dreams. It's okay to set goals, and it's okay to do all things. But think about what your motivation is. Because Solomon had this great piece of wisdom. Don't chase the wind. Chase Jesus. Because what Jesus has for you comes back to this. And if you say... Oh, I'm so depressed on this New Year's Eve. You've depressed me. I don't know what to do. I don't even know where to, where to go from here. Here's a very simple thing. And if you're in this church community, focus on what we, what we say. Love God. Love people. Serve your community. And if you say, well, I don't even believe in God. Love people. Serve our community. Stick around here and you'll find God. 
So if you don't know what else to do, just focus on those things. Because in the end, those are the things that won't be wind. They won't turn into dust at the end of your days. So that's a lesson I've learned. Stop chasing the wind. So you're like, oh my goodness. Where, that's, what am I going to do going into the new year? What resolutions am I going to make? And I'm going to, my resolution is to eat less candy, Greg. Um, but the problem is, is that I also really like candy. So, um, and that's why, you know, I have this. But just simply look at those things and say, okay, when I watch movies, don't try to aspire to be like the movies. Just follow Jesus and understand that all of that stuff is noise, it's entertainment. But focus on being a disciple of Jesus and you can't go wrong. Embrace mystery. There's things you will never know. There were th things that we will never know as, in, in, as humans. There were things we will never know. Embrace that. Set your foundation in Jesus. Stop chasing the wind. Focus on things. And it, it all comes back to living a life where you follow Jesus. And it's just simple lessons. In this next year, look at where you set your goals. Why am I doing that? What is it going to leave me at the end of my days? If you're on, on the hospital bed, and thank God for miraculously that I didn't die on that. It was a widow maker. Um, they found a 100% blockage, and they were able to put a stint in there. I still have some issues with scarring and things. But it's really made me think a lot about why I do what I do. And if you can set those goals, yeah, you can be incredible. You know, the most successful people that are happy, and they're happy, there's the caveat, are probably not doing it for the money. They're probably doing it for a completely different reason. And so check your motivation. Don't chase the wind. So there's some resolutions that I can set you. Thanks, kids, for sitting through this. Okay, good job. You didn't make too much noise. All right, I'm going to close you in prayer and send you on your way. Um, uh, let's pray. Hey, God, thank you for, for some of us here that are, are older, that you've given us grace to live this long. And, um, and we pray, I pray that some of the things that you've taught me will just trickle down into some of the folks here and just to refocus, recenter our lives on you. Because in the end, that center is what's going to make this life meaningful, worthwhile, and impactful on all the people around us. And we know at the end of our days that we're going to be able to hold on to something that is meaningful. So I pray as with these folks go into 2018 um, and look forward that they do it with you at the center of their lives. And we pray for this community that as we go into 2018 that we'll make you the center of our lives and that there will be a true impact upon people in our community, that we will be able to push back against the impact of sin in our community. And so we pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.